Welcome to The Art of Catholic. I'm Matthew Leonard, and this is kind of a big uh, day in the life of The Art of Catholic because this is the 100th episode of this show, and I wasn't sure that I was ever going to make it this far, but I have, and so it's a little bit of a celebration. And I want to thank, uh, first of all, all of you listeners and people who watch on YouTube, especially those of you who have left the five-star reviews over on iTunes. I greatly appreciate that. And... Uh, I hope to do more of this. In fact, if you would like to help me do some more uh, and get these shows out a little more frequently, uh, by all means, head over to patreon.com slash Matthew Leonard. You can contribute as little as five bucks a month uh, and I'll give away books and entrance into Next Level Catholic Academy and all kinds of little things. But most of all, the support is there to help me get more of these out because I love to do this. I think the show fills an important niche in the Catholic conversation. And so uh, I would just like the ability to do more. So if you can help me out, that would be great. Patreon.com slash Matthew Leonard. Now, when I realized that this was the 100th episode of The Art of Catholic, I started thinking, well, who am I going to have on? And I didn't have to think for very long because I thought, wouldn't it be appropriate to basically come back full circle to where it all began? And so I asked my very first guest, John Henry Crosby, to come back on the show, and he graciously agreed to do that. And John Henry Crosby is, in addition to being a very good friend of mine, and our kids play together, and my goodness, we just had a, a social distancing barbecue not long ago, but <laughs> John Henry Crosby uh, is, a, is a translator, he's a writer, he's a critic, he's a cultural entrepreneur, I love that phrase, but he's also the founder and president of the Hildebrand Project. And you can learn about the Hildebrand Project at hildebrandproject.org. What is it? Well, it's an organization that promotes the life and the witness of Dietrich von Hildebrand, who was a 20th century philosopher. So it, it promotes his work to people who might not know who he is. And we're going to talk about Dietrich von Hildebrand in this program, and we're going to get into one of his writings on the topic of death, uh, which obviously is appropriate for lots of different reasons right now in this uh, point in history. But uh, I'm really thrilled to have John Henry back on the show. He is a really, really great man and a boon to the Catholic Church and to you listeners. So, John Henry, welcome back to The Art of Catholic. I'm delighted to be back, uh, Matt, but it's, it's, it's a little intimidating the way you've presented me. You know, it seems like it's only downhill from here as far as your <laughs> listeners are concerned. We should follow the logic of, of um, presidential advisors, you know, before the debates. They always lower expectations so that the candidates can outperform those low expectations. So. Listen, the problem for you is that people have heard you a couple of times already uh, oh, on this no. program because we opened the Art of Catholic show. This is back when it was a live radio show. And uh, oh, we right. opened it by uh, talking about von Hildebrand's fight against Hitler when you, were, you guys were publishing that book. And it was a fascinating story. And so I'd encourage people who haven't listened to that, go back and listen because he was yeah. a huge figure uh, in the World War and, and fighting against Hitler and the propaganda that was coming out of Germany at the time. That's and, right. That's right. Yeah. And then you did and one on, a, what's that? I think it was the same episode, or maybe we made two out of it, but we had a, a long conversation about the Hildebrand on beauty. That was a separate uh, conversation. That was episode oh 63. I went back and oh looked. Oh, my goodness. They blend oh together, I know. Oh, I but, really am a repeat attendee here. So. <laughs> you are. Third time <laughs> is the charm. So you're going to be more scintillating than ever, I am oh. I'm truly sure. <laughs> All right. I'll do my best. Well, it's great to be back, and I'm, I'm so impressed uh, that you're at 100. That's, that's an enormous accomplishment. So um, I, I hope there will be – I don't know how many more you'd like to have. I won't say <laughs> – Next up, 1,000, but... <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's get to 200 first. Let's, let's get start to 200 there. first. Yeah. <laughs> but let's, let's do this. Let's jump into uh, a little bit more of Diedrich von Hildebrand. And for those uh, listeners and, and people watching on YouTube, and by the way, if you are watching on YouTube, by all means, subscribe, because uh, I'm trying to get more of these things out, and you subscribe and click the little bell that's underneath the video, and YouTube notifies you when I come out with uh, new videos. But... For those of you who have not engaged von Hildebrand, uh, first of all, why don't you just give us a little sketch as to who he was so people have context, and then I'd kind of like you to comment on why it is you think that he's really kind of gaining in popularity, especially over the last couple of years, for people in all sides of the spectrum in the Catholic Church. Yeah, and outside of it as well. Yeah. Well, uh, so who was Dietrich von Hildebrand? That's a that's a, a difficult question to, a to answer in brief, just given the um, sort of the scope of the man. As you've already explained, he was uh, indeed a philosopher. Uh, he was a, ca a Catholic convert, 
He was uh, one of the leading voices raised against Nazism and communism, and, and one of the most prominent Catholic voices to do so. And he was, a, he was also um, a kind of defender of Christian culture. He had a tremendous sense of the, of the importance of beauty uh, in all of human life, from the most ordinary aspects of life, the kind of surroundings we live in, all the way up to the way in which we worship and the role of beauty in worship. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people know Van Hildebrand because they uh, they have perhaps come across his widow, uh, Alice Van Hildebrand, who has been perhaps his greatest exponent over the last 30 or 40 years. She is now uh, herself 97, so quite high in years, but uh, uh, is uh, is a much beloved author and essayist and, and also known even. by many yeah. people. Prolific, prolific. Oh, yeah, hundreds of, of essays. And then also hundreds of appearances on EWTN and other uh, radio and media uh, platforms. So, so she's done a tremendous amount, and she has spoken about uh, his his anti-Nazi resistance, his writings on love and marriage. Um, pro- probably his most famous book is Transformation in Christ, uh, which is a work that he wrote actually in the midst of his anti-Nazi resistance. Somehow he had the spiritual wherewithal uh, to write a meditation on really the meaning of Christian conversion and inner transformation. Um, and gave that that book began as a series of retreats that he would give to his friends. So for three summers, he left his work in Vienna, where he was running this anti-Nazi publication, and came to his home in Florence, and he would give what became the chapters of Transformation in Christ. And uh, and that book is has been in print without I think without any break since about 1940. Why do you think uh, he's kind of rising in popularity? Now we know that Benedict the Sixteenth mentions him, uh, if I'm yeah. not mistaken, right? And, and Hart oh, yes. goes back and says, you know, you, you want to know what happens in the 20th century, you got to read von Hildebrand. But, um, and I know I'm paraphrasing there, but why is he yes. gaining such popularity at this point? Because you, yeah. you see his name popping up a whole lot more than I used to uh, years ago. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, uh, I would like to believe... Aside from part, your work, of course. Well, I was going to say, I'd like to believe... <laughs> It's because of that, but not so much because of the work, but because of the response to the work. And that's important because there are a lot of projects that promote something and there's little reaction to the work. But I think what's happened is that the Hildebrand Project has found a way of presenting him to a new generation of young people, of scholars. Um, I mean, I could get into sort of the things that we've done differently um, than, than other organizations. But I mean, we are the the estate of Dietrich von Hildebrand now that's been entrusted to us by Alice von Hildebrand. So we have been working very hard to republish all of his works, including translating works that were never uh, published before. So in the earlier um, iterations of, you might say, Hildebrand promotion, a lot of the work was just not here. So I think one has to give uh, credit there. At the end of the day, though, I think that it has a lot more to do with von Hildebrand himself than anything we've done. I think that von Hildebrand is a kind of towering figure. And if you had to ask me, like, what is the one single reason why Van Hildebrand resonates so much? I think it's because he's a witness and not only a thinker. I think that the uh, the fact that his his thought is beautiful and moving as it is, you know, he writes with a kind of ardor that I think is very contagious, um, is 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 embodied in his own life, you know, and uh, and you see, and I think that's again why the anti-Nazi struggle is so compelling to people because here was someone who put his life on the line, literally, uh, yeah, uh, not just for his conscience but also for his faith. He thought that as a Catholic philosopher, he had a kind of obligation to speak truth to power, and that's why he took the steps that he he did. It's not just that he felt I I'm somehow obligated as a professional thinker uh, to do the the steps, um, but maybe at the end of the day, it comes down to witness. Um, and then also to this this um, this this whole new feature of his thought that was little known, which is the focus on beauty. What I kind of find interesting about him is that uh, in this day and age, where we find so many different polarizing arguments and fragmentation inside the Catholic Church, that he is kind of a via media in a way. He, you can never defang him because he will tell you exactly what it is that he thinks, right? <laughs> yes, right. Uh, in, in very beautiful language, but he pulls no punches when he doesn't agree with something or if he's promoting a particular thought. But even so, I find him a kind of a, a rational middle way in a lot of yeah. ways. And, yeah. and I think that this is one of the reasons why he's resonating with a lot of people uh, in today's church. But let's kind of let's kind of turn toward one of these writings that, uh, again, I think is 
uh, very apropos for not just the, the church and, and people inside of it, but people outside of the church as well. And that is his writings, uh, Jaws of Death, Gate of Heaven. And it's a great title, first of all, I mean, Jaws of Death. The first thing I think of, of course, is Jaws, you know, but uh, <laughs> we're, we're talking about death here. I can just see the cover of the book now when it gets republished. Um, really, I want to read a little bit of highlight from the foreword that's from Alice von Hildebrand, who I had the pleasure of meeting many, many years ago when I first started dating my wife, because my father-in-law and your dad are friends going way, way, way back. They're both professors of Franciscan University, and uh, and Dietrich von Hildebrand was huge in his conversion. Uh, those of you uh, who have listened to Dr. Michael Healy's episodes on hell uh, for the art of Catholic, that's, that is my father-in-law. But Lily von Hildebrand, who's a force in and of herself. Um, She's a the, lioness. Yes, totally. <laughs> uh, and she wrote the foreword for this book. And I want to read this little paragraph that kind of sets the context for our ongoing discussion here about uh, Jaws of, of uh, Death, Gate of Heaven. She says, It is true, of course, that despite these fearful aspects of death, many Christian mystics and privileged saints have longed for death. Dietrich von Hildebrand knew this well, but he also knew that before reaching this pinnacle, they had gone through many stages of profound spiritual growth. He was wary of those who, with false simplicity, jumped to the conclusion that death is marvelous because it implies an encounter with our Creator. And you, your mind kind of goes back to St. Paul, you know, to, to live as Christ, but to die as gain. And all of us are like, yeah, I want to, you know, escape this world. And don't we just want the peace of heaven and all that? And really what the, the kind of the broad scope, and correct me if I'm wrong, but of this little book, it's not very big at all, um, is to remind us that there are some horrifying aspects to death. Yes. That it shouldn't damage yeah. our hope, but we have to treat it appropriately. Is that a correct assessment? Yes, yes, no, absolutely. I think he, I think he knows that um, experientially death is, you know, has these has this dimension of dread and horror and, and deep pain that it causes. And so to write, you know, a book that only celebrates the, um, you know, the afterlife and, and also the sort of the, the perhaps the sort of cheerful assumption that we're all going straight to heaven um, is um, cheapens um really really cheapens everything it cheapens the meaning of life it cheapens the meaning of what it means to live with god um in heaven and so uh and, and i think as a as a good phenomenologist which is to say the kind of philosopher that von hildebrand was who took experience very seriously you just couldn't write a book about death and and sort of dismiss its um its its incredible gravity and so the book as um as you and i have talked about before is is, is really divided into these two parts the one is a, is a meditation on death under the natural aspect. And he tries to um, take very seriously the way in which death looks when you don't have the horizon of faith. Um, and he, he acknowledges, he speaks very graphically about, you know, when, when, when my beloved dies, um, she is a corpse. Uh, she's lifeless. Uh, she will rot. Uh, she goes into the earth. I mean, it's a, it's a very visceral kind of recognition of the, of the reality of death. Um, on the other hand, he he already he discusses and recognizes the fact that there are these what he calls intuitions of immortality, even in life purely from a natural perspective. Um, there are these, as he said, he he says that well, he quotes that wonderful line of Gabriel Marcel, who was a friend of his, a Catholic philosopher um, and friend of Van Hildebrand's, and Marcel has this wonderful line that the lover says to the beloved, "Thou shalt not die." Uh, that is to say that in love is this recognition of the immortality of the beloved and uh, and that even though it's not a kind of proof, there is a um, there's an intimation of immortality, that love ultimately is tragic and unfulfilled. And Van Hildebrand thinks that in all natural goods in the world, that they all have this, that they all give off this kind of message of a world to which they ultimately belong, a world that they foretell, a world that we belong in. Uh, so, but this is just from a natural point of view. He's not even yet arguing from the perspective of faith. Uh, he's just saying that that our lives are shot through with these 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 what he calls intimations of of immortality. And then the second half of the book is you know the firm move into a reflection on all of these matters from the perspective of a of a of a profound and deep Christian faith. And so th that's that's the structure of the book. And you know I think that the what gives the book its kind of dramatic tension. Um, in the second part is because you've, you've come through this kind of 
dark valley, this very deep meditation on death. And then you, the, the beautiful um, uh, truth of the Christian faith around our resurrection. Um, yeah. So anyways, I, I've gotten ahead of ourselves. That's the structure of the book, though. And I think that's very important that he doesn't, uh, as you say, just jump to the, uh, the canonization <laughs> so you've got natural and supernatural aspects of death that we're talking yes. about here. And right. and for those on the natural side of things only, he says, if you stay in this world, and he, and he discusses how uh, if you are only looking at death through natural eyes, then life suddenly becomes meaningless, right? And, and I was yeah. thinking about atheists and others when I was reading through this, thinking if you think that, that for example, uh, death is just something that naturally happens and you dissolve into nothingness or, you know, there's no life after death, then it's going to lead the, to the view that life is absurd. Like, what's the point yeah. of any of this? Yeah. Which a lot of people have come to that conclusion, you know? That's right. That's um, right. And, and so that's the natural aspect. But even inside of this natural view of death, as you commented on, there are these hints of immortality that can be seen and that people experience which, Lord willing, open them up to the supernatural aspect of death, That's which right. then hits in the second half of the book. And one of the, I thought, was one of the most poignant parts of this natural aspect of death and the experience of the human person, which kind of leads you to this understanding that there must be more, uh, was when he was talking about the death of someone that you love. Yes. And, and this is something that so many different people have experienced. I've, I've experienced it myself, uh, having lost uh, my my father at a very young age, and then also my mother. And when my mom died, I'll never forget that the experience that I had, John Henry, was this, this cornerstone of my family was, you know, she battled cancer for five years. But at the moment of death, I remember it was just like this vacuous hole, like she was just gone, right? And even though my mom had died and something in my world, something central to my world was suddenly gone, the rest of the world just kind of kept on going, right? And, and it led to this anger inside of me. Like, don't you understand yeah. what just took place? Yeah. And, and they don't. The radio keeps doing its stupidity and TV's still going on, you know, and people are shopping and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And yet my world had died, a good portion of it. And, and you're like, okay, a, a plate can break, a TV can break or whatever, but a person's not supposed to die. They're not supposed to not exist, and so yeah. if you meditate on that, it has to lead you to some kind of notion that if that is the case, like if that's my response to the death of someone who loves, who I love, that there has to be something more. I found it to be just a powerful, powerful argument on the natural side of things that even people who don't believe in God, you experience the death of somebody you love. It has to tug on you in some way to make you think there's got to be something else. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, that, that that that's that's true and also accurate to what he says in in his in his book. Uh, it's interesting when he brings up the death of the beloved as as an example he wants to meditate on. He says that people who say, including Socrates, who see in death a kind of liberation, he say he says they really can only say that because they only take death from the point of view of their own death, but not from the point of view of those they leave behind. In other words, those who yeah. sorrow and who grieve. Uh, I think that's a very profound point. I mean, it's very, in some sense, it's there's a, they're, they're very consoling and beautiful things, for example, in Plato uh, around death. And certainly he believes in a kind of immortality of the soul. But that, that's a very poignant point that Van Hildebrand makes that, you know, this kind of um, sort of coming to terms with and even sort of cheerfully accepting death is really only from the point of view of, of the person who sort of come to terms with it, but who's not really um, seeing it through the loss of the person left behind. And there, there are a number of very beautiful pages in which von Hildebrand makes that very, very concrete and very vivid. Um, and, and so, yes, I, I think that's a, as you say, that's already a, a powerful, natural um, experience that points to immortality. Now, he does take up the objection, uh, which I think is important, because somebody could say, well, that's, that's understandable. You're having extreme psychological grief. You know, no one can bear the meaninglessness of the world. Um, ultimately, you'll come to some kind of acceptance. And he says that uh, shouldn't we take death as the final word, death in the natural sense, more seriously than we take these hopes for immortality? And he says that might be the case 
if these intimations of immortality were not so deep in us, if they didn't arise in the most central moments of our lives. In other words, they're not kind of like fleeting thoughts or desperate feelings that come to console us after the, the death of a beloved person. We, we already experience at all the key moments in our life, most of them are tied to, you know, to loving relationships of love between our spouse, between spouses, between our parents, our, our most beloved friends, our mentors, um, but other things too. Again, he emphasizes the, the way in which, for example, profound experiences of beauty uh, awaken this sense. And so he wants to give um, a much greater weight to these experiences than maybe like the new the new atheist would because the new atheist argument sort of amounts to you just have to accept that in the end this is all there is and come to peace with it and then there's this sort of very frustrating but but it's hard to call their bluff right because if they just say well you just ultimately have to accept it or you hear people say i have to give up my space for someone else to come along you know and it just seems so callous you know um and van hildebrand says well that would be true if it wasn't for the weightiness of these of these intuitions, so I, I think that's one of that's a very beautiful insight, because because you are going to run into pop psychology, you're going to run into sort of secular people today who really do live uh, a kind of tragic existence. They don't maybe draw the conclusions and say life is meaningless, but they ultimately say it's over when it's over, right? Yeah, and here's Van Hildebrand saying, no, it's there's you have to take more seriously uh, yeah, these, isn't these it, sensitivities. I, I was talking to a friend of mine one time, and and I said. We were talking about life and just kind of bigger picture questions like this. And, and I was attempting to kind of catechize him, actually, and draw him towards the faith. And I, I said, well, how do you, what do you want to, like, do? Like, when it's at the end, what do you want to have happened? And his response was, well, I, I want to leave behind my mark. You know, I, I want to... I want to build this building or whatever and change this skyline or whatever. And, and I thought, really? Like, that's yeah. it? The, yeah. that, that, and then you're gone. Yeah. I, I, it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And, yeah. and these things that you're talking about with love and truth and beauty, these things are so woven into who we are. That, yeah. you know, getting back to beauty, it's this longing for something that you just can't quite grasp here. Yeah. I, yeah. I experience this every time I go on vacation. You know, I'm looking at the ocean or I'm looking at a mountain or whatever. And looking at these things just is not enough, right? Yeah. You got to get into the ocean. You got to climb that mountain. You want to be unified with this beauty that you see. And yeah. you can't on this yeah. side of heaven. And God is that beauty that we want to yeah. be united to. And yet people will yeah. spend obscene amounts of money, even atheists, to go to beautiful places, to have these fleeting <laughs> experiences, and yeah. yet th they're ignoring the ultimate beauty. They're ignoring the ultimate truth out of all of yeah. them. This is kind of what, what von Hildebrand is hinting at here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's, that's absolutely right. And um, uh, uh, yes, I, I think that he uh, is, is very, very good on, on these points. And, and he's also good. I mean, on the one hand, I've tried to emphasize how he says these, these, these intuitions of immortality have to be given some kind of, you have to give them more credence than maybe certain skeptics would want to, right? But on the other hand, of course, he's the, the point of this book is that these are, these are sort of intimations at the natural level, but really without faith, you know, you can ultimately conclude that they are kind of like... Um, well, the German word Sehnsucht is great. It means it means a kind of longing, but there's a there's implicit in that is that you don't have it, right? Um, and and so I think some people might say in the end, well, these are beautiful intimations. We're sort of these quasi transcendent creatures, we humans, but you know, at the end of the day, we're dust and ashes. And this is where you need the other half of the book, right? Well, sure. And as as Saint Paul says, the, we we see through a glass darkly, right? We, we right. don't have the particulars in focus at this point yeah. for what awaits us and, and how that longing is, is perfectly fulfilled. For those of us with faith, we know it's God, but we don't know exactly how it happens, right? Yeah. Now, the book is full of that emphasis. He keeps emphasizing how little we know about this. You know, on the one hand, he'll say things like, you know, death is in a sense, you know, a kind of final act that we take. But what it entails and what it's like and where we go, and he has these very interesting meditations on what will the, you know, we'll, we'll, what will the consciousness of the soul be like when it's separated from the body? We don't know, right? We don't. Um, and and yet uh, he speaks, you know, with that. This is typical typical Hildebrand, you know, that he would not not want to say that just because I don't know what's coming, that somehow I have to sort of give myself over to chance and slip away. No, it's a final action that I have to take. Uh, 
and and of course again in the in the faith context that we have resources uh what we, we now know with some greater certainty what we can what we can take uh in terms of, of concrete steps but i think i i think that the book is um as as you might say as heavy going as the meditations on death are and as much as they take seriously um the the, the darker um dreadful unknown aspects of death i think that it's precisely that that makes the book seem believable and the meditation seem believable and then ultimately the turn to faith. Yeah, but before we turn to the, the side on faith, it, it's interesting because it, as I read about in Lily's foreword and, and Dietrich talks about this himself, but we have a tendency to, to take too facile a view of it and maybe we don't fear it enough. And reading yes. through this first half of it, you know, I've, uh, my whole life is wrapped up in Catholic spirituality. Like that's what I do in next level Catholic Academy. That's what I read and all the rest of it. And you, you can get so wrapped up in this mystical life, which we're all supposed to be in this mystical life, but you forget about that. There is concrete life to be lived and we should have a natural aversion to death that maybe we don't take seriously enough. And, you know, you hear Catholics say, oh, as long as I make it to purgatory, you know, and they kind of view this it's just like a crossing over to the other side is no big deal. Right. Yeah. John of the Cross says, no, purgatory is worse than a thousand deaths. Like you don't want to go there. There is a horror there that's due to sin. Right. Yeah. It's really because of sin, which is why we better work it out in fear and trembling, as St. Paul says. And so we have to have this in mind as we approach life. That it's not all cupcakes and brownies as you're crossing through to the other side. And, yeah. and while we're longing for something that's beyond, there's still the piper to be paid here. And so we have to live appropriately so that that horror and that respect of natural death doesn't overwhelm us. And we can get through that to the supernatural aspect. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's completely right. That is his... Uh... That is one of his great emphases: um, is this uh, this trivialization of life and death, um, such that you know you just it's a it's a we don't really know a lot about the transition, but at the end of the day, it's a transition, and then we're on the other side. Right. That's certainly not the the Hildebrandian account. And I and I have to say, you know, since we're recording this in the um, in the time of of the coronavirus, something that has often struck me that has struck me a lot in the writing among Christians and others, uh, Catholics and Christians, um, on death right now. There's a certain group of people who feel that, you know, the response of say um, governments and the church uh, reflects a kind of lack of faith. I'm not going to. We don't have to comment on the extent to which that might be true, but it's a kind of lack of faith in God and His promises. And it's it's an elevation of the value of life over the value of death at all costs. Um, now there is there is clearly some some truth in that. Uh, one one could imagine that for the person who doesn't believe in death or who simply fears it um, as something to be put off as long as possible, um, and the kind of materialism that that might imply that there would be a, a desire just to um, sort of get back to normal as fast as possible. But there is a tendency, I think, to uh, to actually. Uh, be quite trivial uh, regarding the value of life that we have right now, and and sort of this idea that just because we are made ultimately to live with God in in eternity, that we should sort of, uh, frankly, you know, sort of be kind of um, footloose and francy free with our lives, be risk taking, uh, sort of not imagine um, uh, the remaining years of our life to have any value. Um, I, I find that to be, frankly, a little shocking and and very, just very disappointing. I mean. Uh, in Van, in Van Hildebrand, and really in the whole Christian tradition, both philosophical and theological, there's this very powerful sense that God is the arbiter of life and death, right? And and so th- that's one of the great arguments against suicide in Plato all the way to Christians, which is that God, we, you know, God is the author of our lives. We are not ultimately, we don't have that that right to dispose over our lives, ultimately speaking. And, um, and I think something like that obtains here too, which is that we... Um, we need to try perhaps somewhat harder to <laughs> preserve our lives. Now, in some cases, it's because we have real responsibilities. You and I have small children, right? I mean, uh, we can't be too too quick to, you know, to speak as if we, well, you know, if we all just had a little more faith, we'd meet up on the other side and everything is fine. That's just, so So in Van Hildebrand, there's a, I, I, though he's not addressing this particular moment in time, there's a, there's a strong push against, let's just call it this sort of trivialization around the value of life and also the, the importance of, of, living life fully and, and, and being 
um, living our, our human and Christian existence, you know, sort of the last moment that's granted to us. That's a, that's, that's, I, I would say that that's a Hildebrandian um, counterpoint to a certain tendency now to be dismissive, you know, of efforts to preserve life today. Even if the reasons can be muddied, I understand that yeah. some people just maybe want to extend life, but uh, for the sake of pleasure or fear of death, but, but well, Hildebrand it, would, would push us much further. Well, it's interesting you say that because one of the things that he says in the book, uh, he's talking about uh, Jean Daniel Lu, and Daniel Lu makes the point that uh, there are some people who want to avoid death uh, forever, right? And yeah. but yet the, this leads to its own kind of hell. Yeah. Because who really wants to be immortal? I mean, we live in a fallen world, and there should be something better than this, right? Yeah, it's right, a, right. Yeah, the idea of living of forever like out. this is a kind of horror, yeah. Right. Hildebrand says that too, yeah. It's like a cage of death, and uh, you know, I, I don't want to live forever. I mean, I want to live forever, but with Jesus. I don't want yes. to live forever right. here. It's funny exactly. to me too. I would think about this. You, you oftentimes hear about these guys who are trying to like upload their soul into computers and all the rest of this kind of stuff. It's always like the super rich guys who are doing this that want to prolong their lives because they can afford to have whatever pleasures are, are available to them. And they think they're going to find some satisfaction there. And you and I both know they never will. But yes. those yeah. of us who were on the, the, the lower end of the food chain, so to speak, we don't want to stay here. Why in the world yeah. want to do that? And so I want to face death. I want, I don't desire it to come right away. I want to prolong yeah. my life that God gave me. But, but there's a reality there that uh, one day we're going to, to cross over to the other side. It's unavoidable. I need to have respect for it. But, and here's my pivot point into the next, the second half of the book, <laughs> we have to do this from a Christian perspective, yeah. right? There is a, there's a hope that is involved uh, that, that really informs the way it is that we live and the joy at which we can approach our impending departure from this earth. Yes, yes, no doubt, no doubt. That's, uh, <clears throat> that's um, I don't know where, where you want to go with your question, but that is indeed <laughs> where the book takes us. And, and Van Hildebrand has, a, has some, some very wonderful meditations on sort of the, sort of what it means to introduce the Christian dimension into, um, into death and dying. Uh, and uh, I'll just say something and then you can tell. Well, yeah. what, what well, are you I was tell me? Say, you... There are two things that jumped out of me when I was reading this. Yeah, he yeah. talks about kind tell of me. positive and negative aspects here in, yeah. in the light of faith. And he says, on one hand, there's a kind of a fearful human element because this is the moment of judgment, right? Yes. Uh, when you die, you are going to your particular judgment, one way or the other. Whatever it is you did or didn't do is going to be judged. And while you can have some graces coming to you from the, the treasury of merit of the church, you're not going to be able to hide behind anybody. It's you and Jesus. And there is a fear, a holy fear that should envelop us with regard to this. Even, and this is through the eyes of faith, right? Yeah. Uh, and so that I want to call it negative, but it's, it's kind of the downside, so to speak, because everything we've done is going to be laid bare. And that's not going to be a pleasant experience for just about every single one of us, unless your name's the Virgin Mary, right? And, and then the positive aspect is you pass through that, um, well, that, that moment of judgment is also kind of at the, at the same time, you're face to face with the person who loves you more than anybody else. It's, right. it's union with your beloved, Jesus right. Christ. And so there's kind of this positive and negative and not just union with Jesus, but then union with those people that you left behind, like the beloved that you yeah. lost that we were talking about earlier. And so there are these pluses and minuses to this view of, of death in the light of faith. Yes. Yes. No, I think that's, I think that's very well put. I mean, the, the, I know you're not saying this, maybe, maybe the negative aspect is, um, I mean, it seems to me on, it, it has a negative aspect for those who perhaps have been putting off right living, <laughs> uh, for well, it's going to be scary who, one way or the other, John Henry. Well, I mean, negative well, no, in the sense true. that I'm going to be terrified <laughs> for well, the no, God. That, of the that, that, that is true, but I think the there is the there is also a respect in which one the, the believer who has lived his life or her life um, uh, in, in in an effort to, to love and serve God uh, can also trust in God's justice. Truly. This isn't human justice anymore. Truly. This is something else. So it's it's terrifying because we are we are before the infinite judge, and nothing, as you say, is. Is hidden, but there is even already the, that consolation as well. It's interesting. Hildebrand doesn't really try to avoid, you know. Sometimes there's this idea of saying, "Well, there's hell," but you know, let's kind of talk about hell 
another day and hell is sort of a, a heavy topic. And he does speak in this book a lot about the way in which hell, the fear of hell can be a very reasonable motive for changing your life, right? Uh, and, and, and I think that's, a, that's one of those respects in which Van Hildebrand um, pulls no punches, right? He, 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 he faithfully uh, conveys the, the fullness of the, of the church's tradition. Now, when he talks about the, the, the union with Jesus, he doesn't just talk about the meeting with Jesus, but this, this, the, for, for the person who has longed for union with Christ, this is a kind of you know, mountaintop moment when that finally happens, right, uh, upon your death. And, or, or upon the person's death. And he speaks about how that uh, is the, uh, what did I want to say to you about that, actually? There's so many, so many thoughts crowding. Um, well, well, let, me, let me kind of pivot off of that for a second, yeah, because pivot off that, yeah. um, what, what I would like you to do, he talks about this, this phrase that he uses and that you know, I used to throw around in graduate school when I thought I was sounding you know, really high and mighty, but the intensio unionis, right? Oh, yes. This is something yeah. that's intrinsic, to, that every one of us has this intention toward union. What does he mean by this in relation to what you're talking about with our union with God at the end? That's right. That's right. So he has these various various characteristics of what makes love. Um, and in natural love, there is one of them is called the intentio benevolentiae. That means the intention to do good to the other. And then there's this intention, intention for union. Um, and and obviously, if you think of the paradigm case of, of, of spousal love, there's this, this Obviously, the, the desire to, you know, for both of those dimensions, um, uh, which is which he thinks is characteristic of that love, but he also thinks that in the love of uh, the soul for God, in the love our love for Christ, particularly in His humanity, maybe in the devotion to the Sacred Heart, there is again something like this this intense intention for union, um, which of course cannot be fully realized here. It's realized in a unique way through the Eucharist and through prayer and adoration, but then there's this face-to-face -face encounter with, with the beloved that happens um, at this moment. And so, yes, this is, um, uh, this is that, that, that moment. And then he says uh, something, I think, very interesting again about this. This is what I was wanting to say a moment ago about the, the natural and the supernatural dimensions here, because he says that there's already, he, he discusses hope, right? That's exactly uh, where I he, wanted and, you to go. And, okay. and, he, and he speaks about there is already a, 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 a real legitimate kind of hope at the natural level, right? These intimations of immortality that he's spoken about give rise to a reasonable hope in something like the life thereafter, the life hereafter, and the reunion with those that we love, particularly if that's the kind of central um, sort of yearning that, uh, that seeks fulfillment uh, after death. But then he says that in this moment of the meeting with Christ, um, after death, not the moment of judgment, but the aspect of the, the reunion with Christ is sort of the ultimate basis for the fulfillment of our Christian hope, right? That natural hope is the hope in, you know, that what is sort of foretold in our intuitions will uh, turn out to be true. But then in the, in the supernatural dimension, um, there's a kind of seal of God's love and providence for us that, we, that, is, that, that is most, most uniquely fulfilled in this encounter with with the beloved, and that's a very beautiful and consoling idea because it it, it complements this this idea that sort of we primarily go to our personal judgment, and then on to our general judgment. You know, at the end of time, that there is already this moment um, upon it, this this twofold moment of judgment and unification with the beloved. I, I find that to be very moving, and and that that adds a you know a very powerful, uh, I think maybe new and fuller dimension to our Christian hope. Uh, than we might otherwise have. Well, and it, it it seems natural that he would talk about the virtue of hope as well, because the two sins that that hope fights against are despair and presumption. And so yes. that despair on that those people who are wrapped up in just the natural aspect of death to their own detriment, it, it could lead to despair. And so Christian yeah. hope fixes that, so to speak. And then yes. there are those that are just kind of lottie dying their way through life and presuming upon the grace of, of God and the mercy of God. And, you know, you know, his mercies are new every morning. And so it doesn't matter what it is I did last night. Uh, hope says, nah, no, yeah. because there's, the, you have to live a certain way in order for, for the Christian virtue of hope to actually have an impact on you because hope is transformative. It's not yes. just a, a feeling you have. It is supposed to help transform the way that you live because it shows you the object of your faith. Faith says, this thing is real. 
God is real. Heaven is real. Our final end is going to come. And hope says, yeah. And, and it can lead to something really good if you live your life the right way. And so it transforms then the way that we live. And I, so I found it completely apropos that, that von Hildebrand was talking about the virtue of hope in there. And that's exactly what it is that I was, I was hoping that you would comment on. Um, he actually gives some practical things uh, as well uh, that help us have a more Christian understanding of, of our end and of the more appropriate response. I found it interesting as a guy who spends a lot of time um, harping on people to pray more. Uh, this is one of the primary things that he talks about. And he says, yeah, you, you, need, to, you need to cooperate with the grace given to you by God, no. but you have to pray. Uh, because yes. that's where your relationship with God takes root on this side of life. And so it's not just this esoteric, this is what's going to happen. He gets down to some practicalities of how it is you achieve this. Yes. Yeah, no, that's right. Uh, prayer is, is, is probably the central piece of, of advice. And that corresponds, of course, to his whole, uh, you might say, theology of conversion. Um, there's, a, there's a wonderful passage, just apropos, uh, if any of your readers want to track this down, in a book by Joseph Ratzinger, in which he says that von Hildebrand's analysis of conversion or metanoia in Transformation in Christ is the finest analysis of this idea of, of, of change in constancy or constancy in change uh, that he's aware of in, I don't know if he says in all of theology or in contemporary theological literature, and then he actually summarizes the book. So for people who want a Ratzinger summary of Transformation in Christ, pick up his book, Principles of Theology, and, and you'll find a, a really a very striking uh, summary there. But in the, in that book, you know, the central theme is transformation in Christ. And transformation in Christ is this combination of gratuitous grace and cooperation through the things that we do in response to that. And so prayer, you know, as this privileged way of, of establishing a relationship of love and inspiration and grace with God is, of course, at the center of things for von Hildebrand. But he also offers some other things, and maybe that's what you're in part uh, suggesting. Um, he you know, maybe no, no surprise. These are these aren't particularly original ideas, but they are they they they're very fitting um, in this context. That he, for example, he recommends spiritual reading, okay. reading of the spiritual masters. You know, so it's it's not enough only to pray in the sense that we need to feed ourselves with the wisdom of of these spiritual guides who've come before us. And then the more uh, Hildebrandian uh, piece of advice is the importance of works of beauty, works of art, in. Um, uh, you might say raising the soul, uh, opening our eyes, uh, uh, bringing us to the state of awakeness, which is a, a, a term that you see often in von Hildebrandian writings. It's just, it's just the idea that you live in a real and full consciousness, consciousness of, you know, the great realities of our lives. And that, as he says in this book, we don't sort of wander through in a kind of stupor, but we we're aware of um, the great values in our lives, the the values of beauty, truth, and goodness, the, the values of the great, the people who are placed into our lives to love, and of course then the, uh, the greatness and beauty of our faith. Um, he wants to cultivate a, a very heightened awareness and alertness of this so that it sort of penetrates our experience and is with us uh, and informing us at all times. But it's, it's a very Hildebrandian piece of advice because you don't too often, you know, turn to a spiritual master and, and find them telling you that, you know, listening to you know, great recordings of, of Mozart, chamber music, might be really good for your spiritual life. But von Hildebrand thinks that uh, taken uh, in this, um, in, you know, in this, in this manner, you know, sort of, um, uh, sort of immersing ourselves in the greatness of, of these kinds of works of art and music, also painting and literature, uh, can be very conducive to sustaining this spiritual hope. They'd be reflections of God himself, right? I mean, if yes, God yes, is beauty. Yes. And so the beautiful things that man made in his image creates are going to be reflections back to the beauty of God. So it makes sense. As Catholics, we, we don't want to ignore the world. This is kind of the way that I was raised, in a sense. Uh, I don't want to... We talk about Protestantism always. It's with a broad brush, right? But there was a sense in which a deepening of your spirituality as a Protestant meant getting rid of everything else. And you see this in the churches I grew up in. There's no beauty inside of a, of a church. Most of them don't even look like churches anymore. 
but there's nothing there to raise your mind and your heart to God. And were you, we, we were wanna... you just talking about Catholic churches? <laughs> well, that's the problem, right? So many of them have been stripped of, of the beauty and grandeur that would take us as human beings with five God-given senses that would lift those senses up to God himself. That's why Catholic churches are beautiful. It's not because we like to spend money. It's because it actually deepens our spirituality and deepens our relationship with God Almighty. And Von Hildebrand harps on this constantly, but it's not just with church qua church things. It's beautiful music. It's beautiful art. All of these things help lift us up to God. Yeah. Beauty gives yeah. that soul wings, you know, and, and you soar to God. That's so right. that's, right. yeah. Yeah. That, that's something I think that, frankly, a lot of people, a lot of Catholics, and just a lot of modern, I'll say especially Westerners, particularly Americans, like we've lost uh, an appreciation for beauty and what it can yeah. do for us. Uh, even down to the way we, you know, dress and and how we present ourselves at mass and all the rest, right? It all is part. We've casualized everything, yeah. and yeah. and we're losing something of God. I think in that, uh, just yeah, because no, we we don't no, no we don't focus on it, any yeah. beauty there, and we don't take pride in it. Uh, yeah, the right no kind question of about it. No question about it. You know, and 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 it's important. I don't think he says it in this book, but an important. Sort of counterpart to this this emphasis on the way in which beauty lifts us to God, as you say, gives the soul wings. He loves that image from Plato. Is also, of course, that that things that are not only lacking beauty because they are simple, very simple, for example, but things that you know, when, when you have things that where you have heightened sentimentality and kitsch, which is sort of the ultimate <laughs> swear word in the Hildebrandian world. You know, oh, things Catholics, that are sort of designed. We're not good at that to, at all. Catholics are no good oh, at kitsch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, maybe, yeah, yeah. Well, but, but he, he he would say that those have a kind of, um, in their worst form, can have a kind of corrosive effect on the totally. soul. Now, they're not the same thing as moral evil. It's not like you're looking at, um, you know, I don't know, pornography or committing sort of outright sins. But there is a, there's a, um, he would say that there's something at least analogous um, to uh, more serious sins in the sense that it's sort of, uh, for example, he thinks that real beauty really sort of awakens the soul and brings out both its sensitivity and its strength, whereas kitsch is a kind of, you know, it, that really does soften the spirit and sort of make one mostly susceptible to sort of pleasant feelings and pleasant appetites. Because beauty, of course, is a, is a, is a you know, can be a jarring experience. It's not just an experience of, and I think this is something that's so important to emphasize because a lot of people will say, well, you know, Hildebrand with all of his classical music, isn't this sort of like very polite and it's for fancy 19th century salons? Well, not not if you were Van Hildebrand listening to great music or seeing great art. This was having a powerful and potent effect on him. Um, and I and, and, and I think any of his students and friends who had the, the I never had the opportunity to do, to do this, but I think your father-in-law and my father had the opportunity of experiencing works of music with him. My father once had a chance to be taken all through Vienna with von Hildebrand. And this wasn't just like some kind of little tour. I mean, this was sort of the great and beautiful city of Vienna. Um, or listening to works of music, apparently, it was incredibly intense because he was he had this desire to share his ardent experience of these great works of music with those who were with him. He would he would sort of reach out and hold everyone's hands and say, now watch, watch what's coming now, listen to this passage. Um, so, the, so I just want to emphasize, you know, the the kind of, um, you know, the uh, the kind of strength and um, and vigor with which uh, beauty was experienced by Van Hildebrand and what he has in mind and why he would discourage so much, uh, you know, sort of soft. Uh, sentimental, pious, sort of religious nourishment. Yeah. I realize that maybe this offends some of our our listeners, and it's and and he would always be very merciful. I think Van Hildebrand would realize that you know we are, we come out of a certain culture, we have our certain experiences, and he even thinks that uh, that that God God is great enough that God comes through remarkable media, <laughs> even very inadequate media. Uh, but nevertheless, you know when when we are sort of seeking sort of the richest spiritual nourishment, we should look to real beauty and not um, false substitutes. I think it was uh, Sheldon Van Auken who talks about the pain of beauty. And so it, beauty yeah. isn't just something that you know creates wonderful butterflies inside of us. And, and you can see this like even in the cross, like it's the tragic beauty of the cross. It's our salvation, and yet it's this human suffering. 
Uh, yeah. And and actually, th- this is a great way to segue to a little passage I want to read out of you from from the book, and this will be kind of how we wrap the show up. But he makes this kind of important point. Of, I don't know. It's, it's on page one eleven, so about four fifths of the way through the book, something like that. But he says, "In all matters, the natural aspect of something must never be ignored, but must rather be given its full weight and then eclipsed by the supernatural aspect." Our transformation in Christ should not mean that we somehow cease to be human. And no. I think what we were just talking about with beauty somehow uh, ties into that. But what, what's another part of what's another aspect of what he's talking about here? Yeah, well, in general, Van Hildebrand was always, you know, you could say he really lived by, you know, the maxim, the theologically rich maxim that grace builds on nature. And in all of his work, whether on the spiritual life or on marriage, the sanctifying uh, the, the, the sanctifying graces that are given through the sacraments, there is this recognition that that nature is transformed, not replaced. So uh, whether it's in in the way in which we we grow in the spiritual life or in the way in which we um, for example, for example, in this book, since we're speaking about death, uh, you know, obviously there are these tremendous sufferings associated with death. And they can be given a higher spiritual purpose, and we can unify them with Christ and his sufferings, and they can be redemptive. But that's because they continue to be real human sufferings. You know, they're not just sort of displaced um, and replaced. Uh, and so there's a great emphasis on... He, he, I, one of the things that I love in Van Hildebrand is this ability to hold sort of different um, apparent con- contradictions or contrary sort of dimensions sort of in, in creative tension. Uh, so, for example, he speaks sometimes about the fact that because we have a heart and a will, sometimes we are asked to accept God's will in our life through our will, but we are also, our, our heart is meant to cry out in grief for what we've lost, right? So these dimensions, because if you only think in terms of the will, you have to sort of say, well, in the end, you know, we just have to sort of put our sufferings aside and accept God's will. He says, no, that's that's not really um, a way of honoring sort of the human reality, right? So we we accept God's will, but we also... Um, God wants us to cry out with our hearts. And in some sense, you know, the acceptance of God's will sort of amounts to sort of a suppression of ourselves if we right. uh, if we don't leave room for the heart. So here in the case of, of something like the death of a beloved person, you know, we are meant to uh, to cry out in grief for that for that person. Now, I don't recall the passage where this comes up in the book, and, and, and I'm sure that there are many other respects in which Van Hildebrand would want to avoid sort of de-emphasizing the, um, the natural significance of death. Maybe just the fact that some people want to spiritualize death so much that sort of the fact that death is fearful and a cause of suffering is sort of skipped over, right, in favor of seeing death as our union with Christ, as we spoke about at the beginning of our conversation. Yeah, no, right? I think that, that is exactly his point. So the, the fact that when you look at naturally speaking, we're going to, get to die and those around us are going to die should naturally lead us to tears, Right, yes. but these t- tears are then eventually turned into joy as we are That's unified right. with Christ. And so, what I was thinking about when I was reading it is how it was—it's very incarnational in the sense that yeah. Christ yeah. becomes man, right? So he unifies his humanity; he makes it sacred. He unites it to his divinity, and we pass through his sacred humanity and on into his divinity. And so, there's that progression yeah. from the natural to the divine. And that's right. the mode in which we should be looking at death. And if I'm reading von Hildebrand correctly here, that's that, so. yeah, that, I think that's right. That's right. And so, and that, and that, that applies, you know, in our own journey uh, with respect to death. We don't ultimately um, sort of come to terms with death as a human reality and then sort of clip it and leave it behind. It, it, it it's, it's with us. And, and, and that, and that, that's coherent with his idea that we really sort of live, you know, with this profound unknown regarding death right up until the moment of death itself, right? And no amount of um, sort of appeal to sort of the the spiritual purpose of the spiritual reality to which we are going can ultimately simply dismiss that. Um, and so he's uh, there's there's a great realism, a great incarnationalism, uh, a great anti gnosticism, which is of course our modern tendency to sort of relegate our bodies uh, away. Despite being such a materialistic era, we we also push the body aside and think of ourselves as, you know, we are the ghosts in the machine, right? Right, like Lego pieces, we can kind of mix and match or do whatever we want. Like there's (laughs) no unity between our body and soul and all the right. Yeah, it's crazy. It's great. It leads to all kinds of problems. 
Yes, well, indeed. Well, this yeah. has been a great pleasure, John Henry, and a fitting way to, uh, to spend the 100th episode of The Art of Catholic, diving into Von Hildebrand, since this is what kicked it all off. And please, again, uh, tell people where they can encounter uh, Von Hildebrand in your work. Yeah, so they can come, of course, to the, the Hildebrand Project's website, which is hildebrandproject.org. Uh, we have a, a very active presence, particularly on Facebook. So uh, for people who want to follow us, find out when this book, which we're talking about now, is released. Uh, so for those who hear it, I guess, sort of in real time, the book is still forthcoming. It will come out probably at the end of June. Um, and uh, it can be found on our website, but, you know, particularly on, on the usual places you go finding books, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, etc. Um, but the best way to find out is to follow us either by signing up for our email or um, following us on social media. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you very much. And for those of you who are watching, please uh, uh, like the, the program, share it with people, because I think the von Hildebrand's thought and his legacy is something that is severely needed at this moment in the church for a lot of different reasons, a lot of which we didn't touch on. But von Hildebrand is definitely an important character. And I have to say that personally speaking, I have grown greatly uh, in my appreciation for who he is and what it is that he taught. Just in the last even year, it's hit me more of why he is such an important character. Uh, and so I would like to help you to, to spread the message. And so by all means, if you're watching this, you know, share it with, uh, yeah. with people, subscribe to the show, and, and uh, let's, let's help enliven the the understanding of who we are in christ and von hildebrand nails it in so many ways and so it's important we spread this message so again thank you very much john henry appreciate it greatly thank you for having me now i want to close uh with a a question for those who are uh subscribers or supporters over on patreon 